Um, okay, so I'm an engineer working at Red Hat on networking, various stuff. Uh, it's quite a dynamic job working every year on something else. Uh, but today I'm going to present some interesting stuff that's actually in there in the kernel for years and it's probably going to be there in years to come. Uh, before we start uh, digging into the topic, we'll have to, we'll first have to uh, make clear some general principles behind it. I hope you, all of you are familiar with that, so just let's get through it quickly. So, to really get a traffic in Linux, you need something called networking interface. What is a network interface? Uh, that's something that has a name, it has an ID, uh, and you can actually list it with the command IPA, or maybe ifconvict, that's the old one that you should not be using anymore. Uh, we have two main kinds of network interfaces, those are physical or virtual. Physical uh, represent a NIC, like the physical networking card, that's the slot you have at your laptop, you can plug and cable in, or a Wi-Fi interface. Virtual, that's something that does not exist physically, but that is still useful. For example, a VLAN interface, or a software bridge, or whatever else. Now, interfaces can be stacked, which means you can put interfaces on top of each other, not all interfaces. But for example, a bridge has its ports. So if I have two ports in my server, I put them into a software bridge or a bond, whatever. I have now interfaces that are stacked on top of each other. I can add VLAN on top and so on. So IPA is the command to list network interfaces. Here is the output, an example output. You see uh, the ETH uh, zero, can it, oh, okay, yeah. You can see ETH zero as an example interface. Of course, there probably will be more interfaces uh, listed. This is just example of one of them. Now, let's say you executed APA and you don't see your interfaces or your interface. What's going on? Maybe, just maybe, it's hiding. Sorry? Yeah, where can it be hiding? So the first thing that it can be is a namespace. What is a namespace, or network namespace to be precise? It's a kind of networking container. So let's say I just like spawn another networking stack including all that it contains. So it's kind of, you can really think of that as a container for networking. In fact, if you're using containers, be Docker or anything else, it is probably, it is actually using network namespaces as a part of their setup to isolate themselves from the rest of containers, networking wise. What is important for us is that a single interface is in exactly one networking namespace. It could be the root one, this is the one that is started by default when the computer boots, or it can be another one that was created later. Uh, so, how to list network spaces? There is IP netns command. If you start it, it will just output existing network spaces one per line. And you can now use IPA command to explore uh, a particular network namespace by giving it as a parameter to the dash n. Let's see an example. This, uh, this would be an interface in the my NetNS uh, namespace. As you see, the output is really the same as we saw before, but now we're listing this particular namespace. Again, one interface cannot be in two different namespaces. How yeah. We, you can, yes you can, but I will actually drag you to man pages. Uh, we don't have time to cover all of that here, sorry. Can you please repeat questions for 
Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. So the question was whether you can move interface between namespaces. Um, we have another option to actually list all the network namespaces all together, uh, including all the interfaces they contain, and it is a plotnet CFG tool. Uh, I had a talk five years ago about this tool at, here at DevConf, so if you're interested, watch YouTube. Okay, here you, have, here you are. Um, so let's say you explored all network namespaces and you still don't see your interface. What's going on? Well, maybe, just maybe, it doesn't exist. How could that happen? Well, it's because no driver claims that interface, like driver in the Linux kernel. Why could be that the case? Well, maybe you don't have a driver for your networking card. Or it's not loaded or unloaded. Or maybe it is loaded, <coughs> but the interface is taken by something else. What could that be? We have there a few, few options. First, it could be something called DPDK. It's driver something development kit, I never remember the, the, the acronym. It's kind of user space drivers and libraries. So that means that the kernel is not in charge of the interface anymore, but a user space application or program is. We can list that, we can watch that or see that with dpdk dev bind uh, the s comment, and this is an example. Now we see that this particular interface, this is the PCI ID, that's the number of the, the card on the PCI bus, is actually taken by dpdk. If this comment returns not found for you, you're probably, probably fine, you don't have dpdk installed, and you might be safe. Another option could be virtualization. That's a cool thing nowadays. Everybody is using virtualization. So, yeah. It has some interesting features that are perhaps not that widely used, but they are used sometimes in some specific cases. One of those is called PCI pass-through, which means that instead of emulating devices to a virtual machine, the PCI device is actually assigned to a virtual machine. So the virtual machine is controlling that single PCI device uh, like by itself, without any intervention of the, the, the host kernel. I will, not, I will not tell you any comment to, to list that because we have several virtualization solutions, those are different, so if you suspect this is the case, just look up the configuration of your preferred virtualization solution. Although there's one comment that might help you, that is LSPCI. LSPCI actually is all interfaces, or, or sorry, no, all PCI devices that the system sees, including those that are assigned to pass-through or to DPDK or whatever. So, okay, so let's say that we were successful in finding our interface. We know what its name is. We know where it is. By the way, one more thing. There's a huge tree mounted under slash sys, which gives view on the kernel internals. Uh, if you are a bit skilled in going through there, it's not like an easy thing to, to, to browse or to walk through, but it, you can get used to it. Uh, it also contains mapping from PCI ID to a particle net, uh, network interface. So this might be of another help to you. Well, I will not get into details there. So let's say we have our interface now. So what happens now? Where are the packets going through? What can happen with them? Now, what I will 
talk about today is really a simplified view. So those of us, those of you who are skilled in networking, hi Dave, will, actually more than me, uh, will have to excuse me, I'm doing some intentional uh, simplifications uh, in order for this uh, talk to be, to be more, uh, more edible by you. I actually went into more details two years ago about uh, how packets are flowing through the kernel. So if you are uh, interested in still simplified, but more detailed talk about how packets are flowing through the kernel, yeah, then again, watch YouTube. <coughs> but so we're not going into uh, the packet flow today through kernel, we instead focus on those points where the packets can be stolen, redirected, whatever. Here you have a simplified uh, receive path. Rx means receive in networking terminology. So receive path, there's a NIC, this is network interface controller, this is the hardware card you have. Then the packets flow to the driver in the kernel, then packets are passed to something called traffic control, which is a feature of Linux kernel that we will talk about in a while. Then packets flow through the stack of interfaces, if there is some, there is one. Then finally they reach the TCP IP stack in the kernel, and then they reach a socket, that means your application. <coughs> So what can go wrong on this long path? We will see. <coughs> we have also the opposite direction, that is a transmit path. Uh, it's basically the same in the opposite direction. So socket, TCP IP, stack interfaces, actually I could insert them here as well, but this is not that important for us on the transmit path. Traffic control, driver, the cart. So let's go through them one by one, starting with the receive path. <coughs> uh, <coughs> First thing is the hardware, yeah, your networking card. It has some interesting features that you might not be aware of. First, a lot of, maybe even most of modern networking cards actually have an internal bridge, meaning a switch, switching packets. Why? Well, maybe they have multiple ports, you can plug in multiple cables in there, or maybe they don't, but maybe they can be actually presented to the computer as several different kind of physical cards. So this is called, the, the this second, uh, this uh, letter case is called SRIOV, and it actually allows the hardware the NIC card to present itself as several PCI cards to the, to the operating system. And there is internal bridge, which is deciding to what this interface or what this PCI device the packets should flow to. How can we find out? There is LSPCI2, we already talked about it. And it could show us. Now I see this Ethernet control has actually two virtual functions available. Now, how the bridge is configured in the networking car is really uh, out of scope of this talk. But it's, well, it's basically a bridge. So if you, if you have some experience with like top of direct switches, those devices that do plug into, plug into a network and like uh, plug in cables into that, it's really similar. So you can think of your networking card as a physical bridge attached to the network with multiple cables going through to your computer. So what might be happening if you don't see your traffic? Maybe there, is, there are virtual functions, the, PC, uh, the SIROV uh, device is configured, and maybe they are getting your traffic. So, okay, so we have a single virtual function, all, all the virtual functions are down, or oh, remember, pass-through, yeah? The, 
typical use case of the virtual functions is pass through to virtual machines. But okay, let's say that we've got that out of picture. So what we have, what else we have in the hardware? Again, hardware, especially the networking hardware nowadays is pretty smart. It can do a lot of things. Uh, it contains internal flow tables and filters and all of that stuff. So it gets only the traffic you need to. This is usually not a problem. Unless the Kano developers screwed up, this should just work for you, hopefully. So what we are more interested in is hardware drops. The hardware, the, the card, can indeed drop packets, for example, because its queues are full, or there is some kind of other error. The good news is that we can see this. ETH tool, dash capital S, command is our friend here, it will actually ask the driver to query the hardware to give us some interesting statistics. So here is an example of that. You see car reports that it received 13 frames that actually did not have a valid control checksum, so it they got dropped before they even reached the driver. The full output is very long. You can try that on your laptop if you want. And there is a lot more statistic than that. It, very, it depends on the driver. And those are not the same for all drivers or for yeah, all mix. OK, so now we explored the, uh, the hardware. We look at the statistics. We were watching them. The watch tool is probably our friend here. Uh, <coughs> And then let's go further to the, into the driver. First, the driver may be dropping packets too. Why? Because, for example, of memory pressure. We may be out of memory. Or DM, failed DMA transfer is another option. It's more for the transmit side, but yeah, happens. Uh, various things can happen, like the, the, the buffers could not be mapped and so on. How can we find out? We have IP command with the dash s parameter. <coughs> so let's start IP dash s a or IP dash s l, doesn't really matter, to see the statistics of the driver. Here it is. And I see I have 10, uh, 10 packets classified as errors and 5 as dropped. Errors mean like the mostly errors in the packet for whatever reason, couldn't be parsed. For example, dropped are real drops, so out of memory conditions or similar thing. Again, the difference between ETH tool and IP, ETH tool queries the hardware, IP shows the driver, the software statistics, mostly. Except for drivers, but they not. Uh, now, okay, driver, successfully received and processed the packet. What happens now? Well, it hands it over to the kernel, right? Well, not really. First thing, before that happens, there's a thing called XDP, Express Data Path. Uh, this is stuff that allows users or applications to upload their own BPF program, BPF is kind of virtual machine running in the kernel, so they just have a program, compile it, upload it to the kernel, and it is run for incoming packets. Now, those programs are quite powerful. They can do a lot of things, including, as you guessed it, dropping the packet. So if they return with the XDP drop return code, the packet is just dropped. They can also redirect the packet to a different interface, that would mean that the packets are not appearing where they expect them as well. So this is of interest to us as well. Or they can even modify the packet, which means they can, for example, change their type, I don't know, from IPv4 to IPv6, for example. Not that anyone does it, but yeah, it's possible. Now this is, remind, I have to remind you, this is before the packet is actually processed by the kernel. So when this program finishes, the kernel thinks that the packet 
it was that was modified by XDP as the packet it was received by the wire. So if we're not getting the packets we expect, it's maybe because they were modified. How can you find out? There is a BPF tool command that you hopefully all have installed on your machines. Most uh, recent distributions uh, have that. And recently it got a net uh, command. So if you have a bit older distribution, you might not have BPF tool net. But if you do, you see this. Our ETH0 uh, interface, the two in parentheses is the interface index, so like the, or the number of the interface, has an XDP can load it with this ID. This is an internal ID that is used to identify this particular XDP program. As you see, BPF toolnet is also listing some other BPF programs. So this is useful, we'll get to that later. Okay. Now, if you have an older distribution or just want everything in one place, IPA is your friend because it lists the XDB program as well. <coughs> so let's say we don't have, oh, one more thing. If you want to, if you want to uh, see what the XDP program actually does. Now that is much more complex thing to do. You can use BPF tool to actually dump the program, so you can dump the, the instructions of the program and use your disassembly skills to figure out or just find a program that is actually uploading that and, and so on. Up to you. I just pointed you to the place where it happens or may happen. Okay, now the packet is handed to the kernel. One of the first thing that the kernel does is it runs it through the traffic control subsystem. Uh, this is controlled by a tool called TC. I talked about this uh, tool like three years ago here at DevConf. So if you're interested into a lot of details, how it works, how it can be configured, uh, then you can watch the talk. The TC tool can, it's quite powerful, it can do a lot of things. On the receive part, what is of interest us, or to us is something called policing, which is basically a fancy word to applying some filters to traffic, so matching traffic by certain rules, and applying actions on the, uh, on the packets that matched. There is a huge variety, variety of actions that can be applied. Uh, to, to any, uh, some of those are, of course, interesting to us. I would name drop and mirrored as two prominent examples. Drop is dropping packets, as, as you can, as you probably guessed, and mirrored is uh, redirecting or maybe copying the packets to a different interface. So it can be stealing your packets and directing them elsewhere. There's also a BPF action, which uh, allows executing of a BPF program as a result or after the packet is matched, so as a result of the, of the filter, or even as a filter, by the way, but again, not much interesting to us at this moment. And the BPF program can, of course, drop the packet as well, so BPF uh, action is interesting to us as well. Now, there is a long command that we can use to see all filters configured on a given interface. TC filter show dev and the interface. I will not get into decrypting this um, bit uh, long output. Uh, again, if you're interested what all those words and prefs and uh, columns means, watch my talk from Three years ago. Uh, what is of interest of now is the action drop here. So here I see that actually all IPv6 traffic is dropped.
Okay. Oh, I'm, and at this point, I also <coughs> remind you, if we see action BPF or filter BPF, we might use uh, BPF to net command to actually list all uh, TC BPF programs as well. Might be a well. Now, <coughs> let's assume that we root out TC. And the, so the packet continues flowing <coughs> to the kernel. Next thing it encounters a, or can encounter is VLANs. So the packet can have a VLAN tag in it and we can have a VLAN interface configured. In which case the packet does, is not received on our expected interface but instead is redirected by the kernel to the VLAN interface. Uh, again, IPA is our friend. I'm using, uh, in, the, in the example I will show, I'm uh, adding a dash D uh, option, which lists some more details. Those are not necessary, but especially in case of VLAN interface, it shows some more details. <coughs> what is important is here, yeah, the add sign and it is zero. This, is mean, this means this, this is VLAN interface actually attached to this physical interface. And with this, all packets that have a VLAN header with this VLAN ID are sent to this interface. Uh, the dash D uh, option uh, allows me to see this line. This would not be show, uh, shown without it. So that's why I specified it. Okay, so if there's no interface, pack, maybe packets are appearing on that VLAN interface. We were. VLAN interfaces can be in different namespaces, even in a different namespace than the main interface. So the fact that you do not see any VLAN interfaces does not mean that packets with a certain VLAN ID are not going elsewhere. So watch for your network name spaces and your Docker containers and all of that. How can I find out uh, what interface, or if I have real interface in another name space, how can I find out to which main interface it belongs, or master interface it, want, it belongs to? If I execute IPA command, yeah, again, dash n to see all, everything in that namespace, dash d to some, see some more details. Suddenly there's no ETH0 here. Why? Because in this namespace, there's no ETH0 interface. Remember, it's in different namespace. So IP does not know the name. It shows just this generic uh, identifier, meaning this is an interface with index 2 in this namespace. So namespaces have numbers as well as names. IP and NMS will tell you what, the number, what numbers correspond to what uh, namespaces. So you can find it that way. That's VLANs. But we have more stacked interfaces than just VLAN. We have, for example, software bridges or bonding, teaming, open switch, other stuff. What does that mean? If an interface is, uh, has a master, it means that all traffic that is received on the interface goes to the master. It is not received on that interface. And mind you, this happens, you remember the flow, this happens before the TCP IP stack is actually taken into account when it is even executed. So that means that if you have any IP addresses set on your interface, this is completely irrelevant. It is not consulted, it is not looked at. Yeah, so the interface, so example, if I have ETH0, it is added to a bridge, and I have an IP address on that interface ETH0, well, bad luck. All packets go to bridge first and are received on that interface. Yeah. 
how can we find out whether our interface has a master? Well, IPA. It's here. So now ETA0 is connected to bridge 0. So there will be another interface called bridge 0, which uh, <coughs> 15 actually. <laughs> ah, okay, it's, it's uh, okay. Uh, <coughs> so the bridge zero is the interface that the packets will be uh, received at. Okay, so we figured it out. We know what our topology is, what interface are like master of each other, uh, whatever. Let's move further. Next. Opportunity to drop packets is something you all know, and that's firewall, finally. You see, we finally reached firewall after I'm talking for half an hour, and we covered like, I don't know, dozen different places where packets can be dropped for whatever reason. <coughs> so finally the firewall. Well, actually we have three firewalls in Linux kernel right now. Uh, IP tables, NF tables, and BPA filter, kind of, because that stuff does not really work yet. Let's go through them one by one. IP tables, the good old stuff, or old stuff, rather. <laughs> <coughs> there are rules that you can list. You can configure, of course, and you can list. IP tables dash capital L shows you all the rules that are configured. <coughs> Looks like that. And you see, I have a rule that actually matches all packets and drops them. <laughs> so maybe, just maybe, this is the, or probably it is, this is the problem. The firewall rules can be quite complex. There are multiple chains. Yeah, that can be jumped to and so on, so un uh, un to entangle them takes some effort sometimes. Good luck with that. But yeah, at least we know that's something going on. There's actually one thing that can help us, and that's counters. If I, if I add a dash V option to IP tables, it shows some more details, including counters. So now I know that this rule actually matched three packets already. So three packets get dropped, got dropped. And actually zero packets were accepted as, uh, as expected. One thing, a few more, few more gotchas with IP tables. First, you should pay attention to the default policy. Yeah, this is this stuff. If there is drop here, it means all packet that did not match any rule will get dropped. Yeah, except means obviously accepted. So even if I have no rules here and I have default policy drop, I will still not receive anything. Also, there's not just that one table I showed you. There are actually multiple tables, I think five different tables. Uh, that are executed in various uh, stages of, uh, of the processing of the packet by the IP stack. I can specify the particular table I want to see with dash T. So it's filter, net, mango, raw, security. Uh, just look at them all. I can use IP table save though to see everything at once. So this might come handy. Although the original purpose is to use that for like um, computer processing, it is actually quite readable also by humans. NF tables, that's the new stuff. That's the new firewall. Uh, the basic concepts are really similar. So we have tables, we have chains, and we have rules. The Tables are really the same as uh, with IP tables, so should be no surprise here. 
I can list all the tables that are currently configured because unlike uh, unlike IP tables, NF tables does not have fixed set of tables, so only some tables might actually be configured at a given moment. So I can see them with this command, and I can explore individual tables with the NFT list table and the table name. Or I can use one command list rule set, which will show everything in nicely structured format. So this is an example. Yep. Uh, table, filter, chain input, and here I am dropping all packets. Now, you might be asking, okay, that's nice, so how can I see the stats? The answer is, you could not, unless uh, it was configured in that way, because uh, in NF tables, the counters are not present by default, but you can configure them. So you can actually modify the rules, add counters, and then see them. See the manual pages, how to, to, to know how to do that. N note that IP tables and F tables are not, not actually mutually exclusive. They can coexist, and actually both can be applied. So look for both. <laughs> Uh, it was actually an intentional decision to, to allow smooth transition. So. Uh, okay, then I talk about BP filter, which is a new experimental stuff. Uh, it tries to translate the IP uh, AP tables commands into BPF, but in fact it's XDP, it translates it to XDP. So it's not really at the firewall level, at the TCP IP stack I listed it, that was incorrect. Uh, it is executed at the XDP level, so that means at the driver level. So nothing to see here. Earlier. We were looking for XDP programs, remember? So we would see that. <coughs> now you may be thinking, uh, okay, I have these cool tools. I have Wireshark. I have TCP DAM. I can see all packets, right? Right? <laughs> well, not really. First thing to, to, to talk uh, to, to know is where does TCP dump really sit at? Where is the place where TCP dump or Wireshark or other tools from what point on that pipeline I show, uh, I, I, yeah, I showed, uh, they take the packets. And the answer is uh, here, this point, right before traffic control. What does that mean? That means that packets that are dropped from that point on are seen by TCP down, the packets, okay, the packets that are dropped before this point are not. <laughs> In particular, TCP dump does not see, obviously, packets dropped by hardware. That's obvious because even the operating system, even like the, the and no software actually sees them. It does not see driver drops. So if there is a memory pressure or something, those packets TCP dump does not see. More, important, more importantly, it does not see packets dropped by XDP because XDP is executed at the driver level before the packet is handed over to the kernel. So I will just let that sing a bit. <laughs> yeah, XDP programs can do things that TCP dump does not see. Question for the audience. If XDP modifies a packet, what does TCP dump see? The modified packet, yeah, correct. We have also one other tool that is very, very relevant to this talk, that's called DropWatch. DropWatch operates a very, at a different level than TCP dump. It does not capture packets, but rather it watches all the places in the kernel when packets can be dropped. So whenever any part of the kernel calls an internal function that actually destroys a packet, 
<coughs> Dropwatch sees that, and it periodically reports that to, to you. How does that look? Like this. So it's, it shows that in the past time interval, one packet was dropped at this kernel address. Obviously, it requires some knowledge about what those different functions mean in the kernel. Yeah. Uh, how can you start Dropwatch? Dropwatch-LKS, this parameter means that it should resolve these, these numbers, the addresses, into the symbol names. You will need kernel debug info package for that installed, for this to work. Uh, then you specify start, and then it does its job. We actually have more things that uh, we can use to see even more. Oh, okay, one more, one thing. Got about that? Dropwatch sees almost everything. I'm saying almost. Why? Because obviously it cannot see the hardware drops. That's that's like with say this good thing. But it also does not see XDP drops. Why? Because XDP does not really operate with packets. If you watched my talk uh, two years ago. It does not operate with SK buffs. So that means that the packets are not really freed using the usual kernel functions. So Dropwatch does not see them. So XDP, Dropwatch does not see. We can use Perf. This is an almighty tool that can actually watch anything that's going on in the kernel. Uh, if we use it right, we can even see XDP drops. But this is really something for experts. I encourage all of you to look into that. But if you're scared, don't worry. It is really, really complex. So that was, uh, that was receive part. Let's look at the opposite direction. That's transmit. And I will be really quick here, because it's basically the same as receive part, mostly. So on the TCP IP level, the, oh, okay. On the TCP IP level, uh, there, are, there is IP tables and NF tables that can drop packets. Comments are the same as we as were shown. There is no BP filter at this point because there is no XDP support for outgoing packets yet. So that's TCP IP, then there is traffic control. Traffic control, again, filters, actions, packet <coughs> drops, or mirrored. There's one more thing in the traffic control layer uh, on the transmit path, and that's, uh, that's called shaping, usually, which means packet can be like delayed by, uh, on, the, on the way out. Uh, might be of interest to you as well because, but as I said, this is just delayed, so should not affect you that much. Uh, anyway, this comment can show so-called queue disciplines, which are responsible for delaying the packets and stuff like that. If you see NetM there, be especially careful. That is really powerful stuff that can do a lot of nasty things with your packet. So. Then. Uh, there's driver, can drop packets because of memory pressure, because of failed DMA transfer, whatever. And there is hardware, which can drop packets again because of its own reasons. We can use the IP-S uh, for, for driver drops uh, and ETH2-capital S for the hardware drops. As I say, no XDP yet on egress, so this is or on transmit, so this is actually a bit easier on us. Now, one last thing, and this packet capture TCP dam or Wireshark on the transmit path, because when you start, when you, if, if you ever started that, you notice probably that there are also outgoing packets. So where does that sit? It's right before driver, so it's after the traffic control. It's really symmetrical to, to the receiving path. But it means it doesn't see drops here and here. So packets drop by firewall, packets uh, drop by TC, 
TCP dump does not see on transmit. And with that, we have uh, like five minutes, five, ten minutes for questions. Yes. What about the EBIT cables? Where the train does it? Okay, that's a good question. The question was, what about EB tables? So EB tables are uh, a thing that is really specific to bridges. So when I talk about the, the, the stack, when the, like the, the stack interfaces, when you have a bridge, you have your interfaces connected to it. So the packets flow, flow through your interface to the bridge. Now the code in the bridge driver is executed, is processing those packets. And part of that code is calling EB tables for filtering. So it only affects uh, packets that go through software bridges. Yeah, and it's like tables, and yes, indeed, packets can be dropped there as well. Uh, by the way, NF tables, I'm not sure, does NF tables, David, uh, remember NF tables do support uh, bridge tables or not? Yes. They do, yeah. okay, yeah. So NF tables can do that as well. There's actually more, there are actually ARP tables. Uh, there's more stuff like that that I like, intentionally omitted. But yeah, good point. Another question? Yep. How many eBPF uh, VMs are there in the kernel? How many eBPF VMs are in the kernel? None. Uh, usually, okay. So let me let me be let me more precise. Uh, so VM as a virtual machine executing uh, eBPF code. It's just like one or or. I mean, eBPF code is jitted. So when it is uploaded to the kernel, it's uh, transformed to native instructions and executed as native instructions. In fact, so maybe the question should have been. Uh, how many different points at, w at which uh, deep web programs can be executed are in the kernel, to which I would answer numerous. Uh, I covered uh, the actually two most important uh, when we are talking about packet flows, and that's XDP and TC. Uh, there, but there are actually more points where BPA programs are involved uh, on packet traversal. Another one might be, for example, flow dissector. This is the code that is responsible for parsing packets, so figuring out what are IP headers, TCP headers, and so on. This can be enhanced by specific EBB programs to like, allow custom parsing. Another point is uh, right before uh, packets are received by your application, there are some uh, clever socket filters using BPA. Uh, or for containers, uh, there C group stuff, like control groups. So this is stuff that is used to like, limit resource usage and other usage by a group of applications. And then can be some BPF programs attached as well, which can control, for example, the way sockets are used by applications. Yeah. This is not exhaustive list. This is just like, examples that are relevant here. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, there was this, uh, like data part, like the uh, red uh, uh, red card. Uh, what if there is the creation of this? How does it look? Yep, that's a good question. Um, it's a really good question. So probably the receive part is the interesting one. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. So the question was, uh, when there is a bridge involved, uh, what does TCP dump see, yeah, or where it is attached? So, uh, I said the uh, TCP dump is right here, and stack interface resolution is actually here. Yeah. So if I receive a packet on ETH zero, it goes to driver XDP, then it's seen by TCP, uh, by TCP dump, then it goes to TC, and only then it is redirected to the bridge. Yes. So when you when you start TCP dump on ETH zero, it says all packets received on ETH zero before they are handed over to bridge zero. And now, what happens when? So okay. So again, ETH zero receives driver uh, TCP dump traffic control. Now it goes to bridge zero. It is received there, and the 
it's actually looped in here. Yeah, so TCP dump sees that again on the bridge interface. Yeah, traffic control is run again on the bridge interface, and so on. Okay. Another question? Yes? I did not get the first sentence. Sorry, you said what is one only. So every physical need belongs to one uh, namespace only. How does it come that the traffic comes out from other namespaces? Yeah, so the question is that I said that a single interface can be in a single namespace only. This obviously affects physical interfaces as well. How comes that, packet, that packets flow into containers or other namespaces? Yeah, uh, this is where virtual interfaces come into play. So you actually have to set up a virtual network. You have to set up more interfaces. So usually, uh, how does it work is, you set up a pair of virtual interfaces called VTH. Those are virtual interfaces that are connected to each other, just two. So whenever you send to, whatever is sent to one appears on the other and vice versa. You stick each end to a different namespace and in the root namespace you bridge all of those together, all of those endpoints. So now you have like a uh, virtual network inside your computer. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't mean that if right now you move like your physical interface to a different namespace, not the whole one, you now move into a network connection of your applications. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm not sure I got it correctly. So please so could repeat. your physical uh, name, wrong name, uh, you moved it right now aside to a different namespace. So it doesn't mean that all your applications, Firefox, whatever, so the question was, uh, if I move my physical interface, say, ETH0 to a different namespace, does this mean that Firefox and so on do not have internet connection? The answer is yes, unless they are in the network namespace. So you can move applications between, or okay, not really, applications can be started in different namespaces, or they can actually move themselves between namespaces. So if they are in a space when there isn't for network connection, or not network interface, they obviously do not have network connection. Because yeah. I'm pretty sure I do have a connection, but I don't know why. My, all my net needs disappeared, but I can still browse everything. So you're saying that uh, you sure that there was a case where your all network interfaces disappeared and you were still able to browse the internet. This could be possible only if your browser would be in that in other networking namespace. You can actually find out from procfs, so slash proc, slash uh, pid, slash uh, namespaces, I think. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry for the time. So if you have more questions, please meet Hirka in the hall. So thank you. Thank you.